Chapter 2 The Dawn Tide Jim sprung from sleep to wakefulness in a heartbeat as the world lurched to one side. Instinctively, his hand shot out and caught the edge of his bunk hole before he could topple out to the decking below. The ship was turning. Hard. He pulled back the curtain, blinking the grogginess from his eyes. A handful of the oil lamps had been lit, but the place was empty. He felt the thick tar of medicable on his swollen tongue. The lick's sleep must have made him miss the dawn klaxon, but why hadn't he been dragged from his bunk and flogged for oversleeping? He felt a scratching at his elbow and found Mackett there, anxious for reassurance. Jim fished the last few grains of salt rice from his pocket and laid them down for his pet. It's okay, Mac. You stay here, all right? I'll be right back, I promise. Sliding down from his bunk hole, Jim set his feet unsteadily on the deck. The ship lurched again, turning hard the other way and forcing him to leap over his unstashed tanks as they rolled across the floor, slamming heavily into the bulkhead. He couldn't hear the impact over the scream of the engines, but he felt it through his feet. The ship turning that hard once could be explained. Maybe a chart looker made a mistake and was now being flogged while their course was corrected. But two turns? Jim stood alone in the engineer's bay, unsure of what to do. Suddenly aware of his exposed eye, he retrieved his eyeglass from its stash hook and headed cautiously for the stair to fifth deck. The light on fifth deck was scattered and broken by the thousand low pipes and chains that carried the heat, fuel and gearing power to the rest of the ship. Jim peered around for someone. There was always somebody on watch here, monitoring the various gauges and temperatures. Usually engineers would get a cuffed ear for talking to a crewman, especially while he was working, but that was a small risk to take. He silently prayed that he found a crewman that knew hand sign. Not many of them did, but if they had regular shifts down on fifth, they'd probably know at least some. It was too loud down here to think clearly, let alone speak. He spotted a silhouette up ahead and ducked under a broad pipe to head toward it, almost tripping over something in the process. Catching himself before he fell, Jim saw the outline of the obstacle. A foot. The bosun lay sprawled across the decking, face down and still, a pool of oily brown lick spittle flowing slowly from his slack jaw. His copper beater rolled around nearby with the swaying of the ship. Jim moved toward his master's head and felt for a beat in the leathery neck. There it was. He wasn't dead then, just out cold. There was blood on his cowl. Perhaps he'd fallen when the ship lurched. Jim's brain caught up with his situation. He needed to find help, fast, lest he was discovered like this and assumed guilty. A movement caught his eye. A figure crouched behind a standpipe across from the body. Another engineer kid. Mike. Jim signed to the older boy. What's happening? Was this you? Mike shook his head slowly, wearing a grim expression. He raised a hand to his face, covering one eye, in a sign that Jim only knew from the stories. Pirates. Jim's blood turned to ice in his veins. His lick's swollen tongue felt suddenly dry and would not let him swallow. Pirates would kill them all, or take them as slaves, or set them adrift on the sea toward starvation and madness. Mike reached from his side and snatched the heavy copper beater from the floor as it rolled toward him. Then, sneaking a last look above the standpipe, he disappeared in the direction of the silhouette. Jim crept over the bosun's body and hurried after Mike, his palms sweating. The older boy whirled around wild-eyed, the beater raised to strike, only just stopping himself from dashing it into Jim's skull. What are you doing? he demanded. Jim moved his hands apart and then together and added the sign for questioning. We should stick together? Mike shook his head. You should hide. Leave this to the full groans. And with that, he slipped away.
Jim did as he was told. For what felt like an eternity, he crouched, frozen still behind the standpipe, straining hopelessly for any sound from above. Eventually, his imagination and curiosity got the better of him. He had to at least see what was happening, and who better to move through the ship unseen than an engineer? Stealing back down to six, Jim collected his rope and hooks and headed for a port side access panel. There were few better hiding places than the narrow cavity between the superstructure and the hull, and there were unpatched holes aplenty that he could use to spy on the action. The climb up was interrupted by the engines giving out. Whether deliberate or by sabotage, the trussle was no longer under power, and with the departure of the power, so returned Jim's hearing. He heard the unmistakable crack of gunfire from somewhere above, and a grinding against the outside of the hull, just inches from where he hid. Careful now not to give himself away by the noise of his climbing, Jim continued upward toward an unpatched hole in the hull no larger than his own head. Magflies buzzed hungrily around the lip of the opening, gnawing and widening it a mouthful at a time. Jim swatted them away with a whip of his rope and settled himself against the superstructure. It took a moment for his good eye to adjust to the bright sunlight streaming through the hole, and a moment longer for his bad eye to catch up, but soon he was able to cautiously bring his face to the jagged hole and peer out. Great ropes were laid against the hull, reaching up further than he could see. Craning his head downward, he saw their anchorage. A boat, barely one-fifth the size of the trossel, with a half-dozen such ropes clinging to the sides and top of the larger ship like an octopus grappling a larger prey. The ship was queerly made. She had huge white sails for power, odd enough, but stranger still, she seemed to be made almost entirely of wood. Jim squinted at the peculiar vessel, discerning the figures of pirates on her deck, dashing between cover as gunfire rained down overhead. There was a yell from above and a terrible scraping sound, then a great mass of scrap metal plummeted from the trossel hitting its mark and smashing into the wooden pirate ship below, tearing sails and snapping ropes as it went. There was a great cheer from the crew above as the pirates below leapt to secure the broken lines. Jim froze as he heard movement directly above him. Stealing a glance upwards, he saw boots stepping across the superstructure through a larger hole in the hull. Borders. Jim's mind raced. He was level with three deck, so the pirates were coming aboard on two, right beneath the fighting on top deck. He had to find a master, or or even just a crewman. They'd know what to do. Jim mapped the scene in his mind. From here, the quickest route out of the hull cavity and into the ship proper was through the large rust hole directly above him. But that was no good. The boarding pirates would surely be watching their backs guarding their escape. But there were many other holes on too. Repairing the damage inflicted by the swarms of hungry magflies was a constant battle, but the lower decks were always the priority, being that much closer to the water. Up here, there were holes aplenty. Jim hurried toward the bow of the ship, climbing nimbly between the steel struts of the superstructure. There, above him, familiar rays of daylight speared through the hull old bullet holes now widened by magflies, and opposite, the air intake he'd repaired a few months back. He climbed up, inspecting the grating around the air duct, just as he'd remembered a shoddy bit of welding by one of the other boys, right next to a damaged section of the hull. Magflies had made short work of the thin metal, which was now barely hanging in place. Jim peered through to two decks, checking the coast was clear, then braced himself against a strut and kicked against the damaged grate, tearing through it like cloth. Scurrying through, Jim found two deck deserted. The oil light up here was augmented by shafts of daylight filtering down from top deck, along with the sound of footsteps, gunshots and the cries of battle. Jim rarely spent time on two. It was mostly accommodation for the masters, and when he did, It was best to stay out of the way. 
Today, he needed to find someone, though it went against the instinct of many years on board. He pulled open the first few dorms and found them empty, some immaculate, some clearly evacuated in a hurry. Then, bathed in a pool of light from above, a body. A wiry crewman sprawled across the deck at an awkward angle. Jim crept closer and felt for a beat. It was weak, but there. His skull had been cracked by a bloody stone lying nearby. Jim tried again to swallow, but his tongue still refused. Suddenly a hand clamped across Jim's mouth, dragging him back into the gloom. Panicked, he lashed out and bit down hard. His attacker cried out, dropped him, and struck him across the face with the back of a hand. Jim fell hard to the deck and felt the lens of his eyeglass shatter beneath him. He whirled around, his head reeling from the blow. Pa Carrick stood over him, his image broken and refracted through the shattered lens. He reached down once more and Jim braced for the punishing blow, but it never came. Instead, Jim found himself dragged into a dark dorm and felt the hot, stale breath of the par on his face. Heretics! They're here, on this deck! He rasped, an inch from Jim's cheek. Jim squirmed away from the old man. I know, Pa. I came up to tell someone, but the- Jim was hushed by a thick finger pressed to his lips. What's your name? Rasped the Pa. My name... Jim. Jim Hatcher, Pa. He answered, a little off guard. He'd been on the trossel now eight years and couldn't remember ever saying his own name aloud. Go above, Jim. You must tell them we are down here. If they take the ship, we'll all be killed. Find someone. And with that, the old Pa thrust him from the dorm, pulling the bulkhead door shut between them. Jim steadied himself against the wall, squinting through the broken lens that split each shaft of daylight into three. His cheek burned from the par's blow, but now... Now he had a task. The old priest had charged him with saving the ship from the pirates, just like in the stories. Summoning his courage, Jim crept toward the broad top-deck stair, slinking from one hide to the next along the way. The sounds of gunfire were loudest here, and as he drew near he saw the figures of two armed men in the oily grey overalls that marked them as the Trossel's own crew. They were crouched almost to their bellies at the top of the stair, and were firing out across top deck from behind the scant cover it provided. But before Jim could sprint up the broad steps and warn them of the danger below, a movement in the darkness beyond the staircase froze him. A heavy-set, bearded man was creeping toward the defenders from below. His face was hidden by a deep hood, but his thick, tattooed arms were bare, and he carried a heavy beater in one hand. His gait was lopsided as he crept. Jim had to stifle a gasp as he saw the man's right leg was missing from the knee down, a bright copper prosthetic taking its place. The pirate nodded across the foot of the stairwell, and Jim followed his gaze to another figure lurking in the darkness. A woman, this time. Young, barely older than Mike, and handsome. She had a dull, purple sash bound around her left arm and carried a tall staff in her right. Peering up at the trossel's defenders upon the stair, she reached into a satchel and withdrew a smooth stone couching it in a strip of fabric at the top of her staff. Jim's mind raced. He couldn't catch the crewman's eyes from down here. Their attention was fixed firmly on the fighting above. And even if he could, they were top-deckers. They wouldn't know the hand sign to read his silent warning. And he couldn't reach the stair, not without running between the approaching pirates. But he had to do something. Before he could make up his mind, there was a cry of pain, and one of the two defenders was thrown backward down the stair to crumple in a twitching heap. A spear protruded from his chest, capped in a fat cylinder which spat bright sparks of blue light. Jim's eyes widened, and he felt his jaw grow slack. Tech. 
the pirates had tech. The woman pirate, still hidden, lowered her staff and began to swing the stone back and forth, her gaze still locked on the remaining crewmen. Jim's head swam with the accumulated lessons of a hundred stories. Brave heroes defending their homes and ships from the scum of the sea, from heretic pirates. The stone began to spin faster. Marshalling his nerve, Jim darted forward from his hide toward the stair, screaming over the din of gunfire. Down here! They're down here! Pirates! Just in time, the trussel's remaining gunman threw himself to the side. The slung stone exploded against the steel stair where his head had been just a heartbeat before. He fell to his back and whirled the gun around, spraying a hail of fire down into the deck below. The two pirates dived for cover as bullets ricocheted all around, slamming into the body of the twitching crewman and sending sparks into the darkness. Jim blinked checking himself over, but he was miraculously unhurt. As the smoke cleared, the gunman locked eyes with Jim and for a moment looked like he might fire again. Then a blur from above, and from nowhere a third pirate appeared behind the man, pressing a crooked blade to his throat. That's enough. Easy now. This third pirate was young, only perhaps Jim's age, but his voice was full of confidence and calm. Down she goes. You'll, you'll hang for this. You know that? Hang as murderers. The crewman stammered, but a prod of the knife persuaded him to obey. He let the weapon clatter down the steps and raised his hands. A gruff voice came from the darkness at the foot of the stair. Murderers, is it? Jim turned to see the peg-legged man step into the light, yanking the spear free of the twitching body. The twitching stopped, leaving only a limp corpse riddled with bullet wounds. It was you as killed your friend, Fekwa. He looked at Jim for the first time, the spear tip still arcing with the blue light of tech. And you, eh? Some sort of Fek hero? Could have got a sore shot up? He raised the arcing spear tip and in the blue-white light, Jim saw that the beard was in fact not a beard at all, but a swirling tattoo across his lower face. The metal leg clanged against decking as he lurched forward, grinning cruelly. Jim backed away, then turned to run, to find somewhere to hide in the darkness, or... <clears throat> he slammed right into the sling woman immovable as a wall, and a full handspan taller than he was. She raised an eyebrow. <laughs> Shouldn't have made a miss, bro, jeered the peg-legged pirate, now close behind him. Don't like to miss, do you, Dodge? There was a brief flash of tech light, and pain erupted in his back, spreading until it seized his whole body in an agonising rigour. He saw the copper peg leg, and the floor close up, and wondered how he got there. A heartbeat later, and he was swimming in blackness. Daylight pierced the darkness as he woke, split three times and refracted through the thick, shattered lens of his eyeglass. Every muscle ached, and he felt the hot pang of the par's blow swelling beneath his good eye. The burns on his forearms chafed painfully against a rough rope behind his back, and he realised he was bound. A fresh sea breeze blew over him, free of the usual diesel tang. He blinked into the light, trying to process everything. He was on top deck. There were other engineer kids kneeling nearby, also bound at the wrist. He saw Lachlan and Bus and a handful of others whose faces he couldn't make out. Mike lay nearby, still but awake, his left eye split and bloody. Instinctively, Jim tried to sign, but his hands were useless behind him. Rolling to his back, he strained and tried to sit. Pain flared between his shoulder blades and he collapsed, remembering the sling woman, the one-legged pirate, and the arcing blue-white light. That was it. He'd been struck with the tech spear. 
Gritting his teeth against the pain, he tried again and managed eventually to struggle to his knees. Should have stayed down, Squint, whispered Bus next to him. Might have left you alone, runt like you. What's... what's going to happen? Jim rasped through a dry throat. They'll sell us, probably. Kill those they can't. Bus spat blood onto the ground and indicated the high ship's railing above them. They already threw the captain overboard. Jim's palms began to sweat. So they were killers, just like the pa said. He scanned the deck, weighing the state of things. The pirates were clearly in charge now. Jim saw the one-legged man strutting around a group of the senior crewmen, his heavy beater prodding them here and there. The man's hood was drawn back now, revealing more of the swirling tattoos that covered the lower half of his face. Not the face of a man, not quite. In fact, he couldn't have been any older than Mike. In fact, as Jim looked around, not one of the pirates was full-grown. He saw again the knifeman that had appeared from nowhere, now turning out the pockets of the prisoners with a grin. A huge Eastner boy with bright, narrow eyes, thick arms crossed over a barrel chest, smiled and joked with the other pirates as they went about the business of sorting, searching and binding the Trossel's crew. A firm voice carried on the breeze. Found a cleric. Jim turned to see the sling woman emerging from below, even more striking now in the daylight. Daj, she had been called. She shoved Pa Carrick before her, moving confidently and handling the old preacher with a ruthless iron strength. He was hiding below, she added pointedly. The Pa bristled with indignation, but on seeing the state of things on deck seemed to swallow his pride and stayed put when he was shoved to his knees to be bound alongside the others. Jim, filled with shame at having failed in the task set for him by the Pa, tried not to meet his eye. Darge whistled a low call at another pirate on the quarterdeck, before tossing one of the Trossel's rifles up to him. The boy that caught it was small and frail-looking, his skull thickly bandaged, though he appeared unhurt. He caught the weapon clumsily, then wound up and flung it, well clear of the hull and into the water below. Jim saw he had a pile of a dozen similar guns already at his feet. Jim pictured the captain being flung overboard, discarded like those guns, and tried not to think about what would happen to him if he was deemed too small, deformed or runty to sell. He longed to adjust his lopsided, broken eyeglass to appear more normal, strong, but with his hands bound, he was helpless. He swallowed. Overboard. That was the worst way to go, for sure. None of the engineers could swim, of course. Swimming was forbidden. No surer way to keep your workers from escaping than to have it so they couldn't make it to shore. Captain on deck, called Darge. And, as one, the pirates stood to attention, as if jerked upright by unseen strings. A boy with rusty red hair strode onto the quarterdeck above them, leading someone by a rope. He wore a short waistcoat over a ragged purple tunic and looked to be unarmed, though he moved with a supple strength. This captain couldn't have been any older than seventeen. In fact, Jim wondered if there were any full-growns among them at all, and how they functioned without. The red-haired boy tugged the rope roughly, and Jim saw at last the man at its other end. The bosun, gritty and coarse, but defiant still. "'What are you to do with me, then, scum?' barked the old master, spitting licks over the rail to the sea below. "'Nothing at all.' said the captain simply, removing the rope from the bosun's neck and indicating the railing and the short ledge beyond it. Just stand yourself up there. You must think me dim. You're angling to throw me overboard. You're a murderer. The bosun thrust his chin out. Well, I won't make it no easier for you. We'll do no such thing. The young captain shook his head. You're going to throw yourself overboard, see? The bosun laughed, 
but Jim could hear the defiance in his voice begin to falter. (laughs) Why in the nine floods would I do that? Well, the alternative is that I let Daj count up every scar she finds on those boys. The captain pointed down toward Jim and the other captives. She started out with slavers, you know. You can imagine the sorts of things she's seen. Not keen in your type. We aren't slavers. This is a workship. The lads work a debt. Look. He fumbled in his pocket, withdrawing his ledger and blustering through the pages. Here, yeah. Mike, 273 days, uh, bustling. Just 86 days left. It's just what they owe, that's all. He rapped a finger on the page, brandishing the ledger as if the case for his emancipation couldn't be simpler. The captain's temper flared for the briefest moment, and he snatched the tattered notebook from the bosun's hand. You want to talk about debts owed? Okay. He turned to look down at the deck. Daj, start counting. Aye, Cap. Daj nodded, striding toward Mike and kneeling. He resisted at first, but her firm grip and hard stare soon warned him to keep himself still. The bosun watched in horror as she lifted his shirt, revealing a strong chest riddled with old burns. No, no, no. Okay, okay. He turned to the captain. What do you want? I'm starting to think I want to see all those burns paid back. Eye for an eye. Isn't that how it goes, Par? But Par Carrick kept his head down. Sensing his allies thinning, the old bosun began to clutch at the captain's tunic, his defiance all but forgotten. Come on, please. There must be something. Anything. Well... Just tell me, what is it you want? I always wanted to learn how to swim. What? Never did learn, growing up. Bet you did, though, eh? Different times and all that. The captain drew close to the bosun, pointing out at the horizon. There's a rock out there. You see it? Just shy of six clicks, I'd say. Imagine being able to swim that far. Just to pick a spot on the horizon and get there, all under your own power. So freeing. You'd like to be free, wouldn't you? The bosun seemed to catch on. You're not serious. The captain called back over his shoulder. Where are we at, Daj? 27 lashes. She replied, now on her fourth subject. Eight burns, two broken noses. One lad claims he was given to the captain for the night. Lockling! The bosun raged, then turned to the captain again, pleading. That's not true. It's not bloody true. Of course not. Strange that you knew the lad's name, though, without being told, the captain mused. Oh, God! Oh, God! The bosun wailed. Clutching the railing now, he began to weep, shaking his head against the injustice of it all. For all his cruelty, Jim couldn't help but feel a pang of pity for the old bully, even now at his reckoning. The captain patted him on the shoulder. Come now. There is a way out of this, you know. The bosun looked up, shaking his head. Here's a trick! You, you, you shoot me the minute I hit the water! I will not. All your guns have been tossed over and we don't carry them. I'm not fond. Clumsy, random things. So, so I just have to swim? The bosun looked out at the water, a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Truly? That's all? (laughs) That's all? The captain laughed. It's six clicks, man. Come on. But, yes. The young face hardened then, staring coldly at the old master. It's probably wiser than sticking around here and facing up to what you've done. The bosun nodded and seemed to summon his courage at last. The old back straightened, then all of a sudden he pulled off his bloody cowl and loosened his heavy belt, letting it clatter to the deck. 
scrambling over the rail and out onto the narrow ledge, he stopped to raise a leg and tug at a tired old boot. Wait, called the captain, halting him. Probably want to keep your boots on. There's sharks, see? A good boot gives you the chance to kind of slip free. The first time, anyway. The bosun glanced down at the water, then back at the captain, fresh horror on his face. Wait, there's... <laughs> the captain shoved. The old bosun fell backwards with a scream, the boot still clutched in his hand. His howl of terror was cut short, punctuated by a splash of water far below. The other engineers gasped and stole looks at one another, fear in their eyes. Have courage, boys! The pa rasped, drawing himself up. The pirate captain swung over the near side of the rail and climbed nimbly down to the deck alongside Daj. He flicked through the ledger, reading names as he went. Right, Mike, Bus, Lachlan. He flipped a dozen more pages. All of you, listen up. Any of you that want no more of this, you make yourselves known. Some of the boys glanced at one another, but none spoke. They all knew from a young age to expect this kind of trickery from pirates. Courage, boys! Called the pa again. They are murderers! They have heretical techs aboard! And females! This boy is godless! You'll be found by the machines! Or sold as slaves! They already are slaves, idiot. Daj thrust him back to his hands and knees with a sharp shove of her staff. Some would sell you, surely. But your preacher doesn't know me, spoke the captain calmly. Work for a time, and on my word, you'll be put ashore if you wish. He looked around at the boys for a response, but none came. Jim stared at the floor. He desperately wanted to be ashore, but it was a terrible risk. Whatever this boy said, slavery was worse than what they had here. Here, at least, there was an end. They would pay off their debt and be free to work for coin. None of you. The boy shook his head in astonishment. Truly, you are the best kind of slaves. He turned, and with a smooth, supple motion, flung the ledger up past the quarterdeck and overboard. He looked around for any hint of reconsiderates, but seeing none, turned to leave. Very well. May your next master be less cruel than the old boatswain. Cap, wait! As he turned, one of his companions called out and dashed over to whisper in his ear. This pirate was slender, his uncommonly kind face crowned with a purple bandana. He gestured down toward the queer wooden ship below, leading the captain to sea. The captain strode to the grab rail and peered down, then turned back to the captive engineers with a frown. Change of plan. It seems your lot damaged our shielding in the fight. Who among you is the best weld maker? Jim's chest constricted. He stared at the ground so hard he thought he might bore holes in the hull. He'd never worked on shielding, of course, but none of the other boys could weld as neatly or as fast as he could, and they knew it. In other circumstances, they would never admit it, not in a thousand tides, but... Squint, murmured a voice behind him. Yeah, squint, agreed Bus quickly beside him. It's squint, nodded Mike. Soon there was a chorus of overlapping mumbled answers, none of the boys meeting his eye or that of the captain. Well, growled the captain, which one of you is bloody... Oh, I see. The captain crouched before Jim and took his chin in a firm hand, guiding his gaze upward. The face beneath the shock of rusty hair was stern, but still somehow childlike. Dark eyes seemed to take in every detail of Jim's face, lingering on the eyeglass and the weeping blue eye beneath. You got scanned blood, lad? He asked coldly, pulling a knife from his boot, tossing it and catching it nimbly by the hilt. Jim shook his head emphatically, his mouth suddenly dry, his tongue slack for words. 
The captain looked at Jim's dark skin and hair and seemed to accept this for true. Name? he demanded, reaching around to cut Jim's bonds. Jim. Jim Hatcher, sir. The captain grunted a laugh and pulled Jim to his feet, shoving him toward the wily young pirate with the crooked knife. North, take Jim Hatcher, sir, to the Archon. Our voyage through the world of the Risen Tide continues in the next chapter, which you can find by following the links on screen. New chapters will be uploaded on Monday and Thursday every week, so hit subscribe to stay up to date, or if you just can't wait, the full tale is available today on Audible, Spotify and more. Thanks for listening.